Welcome. I'm Kelly Snavely, Director of Marketing and Communications for the Lancaster Conservancy, and I am thrilled you are joining us for tonight's Nature Hour lecture. Lancaster Conservancy is an accredited nonprofit land trust that protects and restores natural lands for future generations. Since our founding in 1969 by local anglers, hunters, and naturalists, the Conservancy has saved over 10,000 acres of land to protect the ecosystems and landscapes upon which we depend for food, clean water, clean air, economic and public health, and the restoration of body, mind, and spirit. We manage the lands we own in 50 nature preserves and care for over 45 miles of hiking trails. Our preserves located in Lancaster County, PA, as well as along the Susquehanna River in York County, are open to the public free of charge 365 days a year and provide opportunities for passive recreation like hiking, hunting, fishing, and swimming. We have protected some of the most beautiful and beloved natural places in the area. Places like Climbers Run, Walsh Mountain, Otter Creek, Tuckwan Glen, and Shanks Ferry Wildflower Preserves. Our work connects our community with nature and protects the health of our lands, waterways, and local wildlife forever. As a member-supported organization, we need your help to save nature. The Conservancy's Nature Hour Lecture Series brings an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help you better understand our natural world, conservation, and the work of the Conservancy and our community and regional partners. Tonight's Nature Hour is our last of 2022, but Nature Hour will return in 2023. While you wait for our announcement of the 2023 Winter Nature Hour lineup, you can tune in to Conservancy TV and watch any of our past online lectures on the Conservancy's YouTube page. We also encourage you to sign up for our many other um, upcoming educational events and volunteer work days and hikes at lancasterconservancy.org backslash events. I'd also like to take a moment to invite you to join us for the Extra Give, Lancaster, Lancaster County's largest day of community giving, which is on Friday, November 18th. Your gift to the Conservancy on that day will be matched thanks to the Conservancy's generous donors and annual sponsors. Celebrate this extraordinary day with us at Luca in downtown Lancaster from 5 to 10 p.m. as we work to save our woods and waters together. Learn more on our website and don't forget to donate to the Conservancy and all of your other favorite community organizations on November 18th. The Conservancy is also grateful for the incredible support of our annual sponsors that make our work, including tonight's lecture, possible. I'd like to take a moment to recognize our annual sponsors, which include Clark Associates, Stoffers of Kissel Hill, Lexwama, Electron Energy, Eurofins, Dart, Ritu Associates, and Penstone. Thank you to these companies for their commitment to the Conservancy's mission. And now, I am excited to introduce my colleague and tonight's presenter, Keith Williams, the Conservancy's Community Engagement Coordinator. Keith is an environmental educator, naturalist, writer, and photographer. He has a bachelor's degree in environmental biology from Kutztown University and a master's in ecological teaching and learning from the Lesley University Audubon Expedition Institute. Keith was the founding director of education and is the past executive director of one of the largest outdoor education programs in the US. Most importantly, he spends much of his time snorkeling in our streams and rivers. Welcome, Keith. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kelly. I spent a ton of time. I put this book out. In fact, I spent so much time doing this stuff and I just love it. And I am in Oregon right now, uh, snorkeling rivers and streams. And I'm in the offices, the studio of this amazing organization called Freshwaters Illustrated. So all this incredible photography you see behind me, it represents their work. They are the, the most amazing freshwater underwater storytellers. And just want to give them a shout out for allowing me to be here and kind of take over their studio space to talk to you about Seasons of the Stream. And I'm here in Oregon to look at the Seasons of the Streams here, um, and, and specifically in the Coast Range. And so, you know, from the surface, the Coast Range streams don't vary a whole lot throughout the year. You know, the climate on the coast is pretty, pretty uh, similar uh, without a lot of temperature swings uh, through the seasons, and there's not a whole lot of deciduous trees. And so from the surface, they appear to, to not change a whole lot. But man, beneath the surface, there is just amazing stuff going on in these rivers and streams that are the ancestral waters of the Kalapuya people and the current waters of the Kalapuya people. Um, the salmon are, are coming up, the fall run Chinook and the fall run Coho are just now coming into the streams. And these are anadromous fish. They spend their lives out in the ocean. They come into freshwater spawn. 
and they die in the process. And it's just one of the most amazing uh, uh, natural events to be a part of. When you get in that river with those fish and you snorkel with them and you watch them um, and you see the, the journey in their eye uh, as they are producing the next generation and dying in the process, uh, there's this, this all kinds of emotion tied into that, um, excitement and awe and sadness and hope. Um, and that is the big, the big telltale of, of uh, fall streams here in Oregon, where, I'm, where I plan to spend the next week snorkeling with these amazing beings. But back home in our creeks, the seasons feel like they're a little bit more well-defined from the surface, right? We have leaf fall, we have those deciduous trees, those beautiful forests that, that the conservancy protects, that protects that beautiful clean water like here at, at Climbers Run. We have all that leaf fall and all that leaf matter making its way into the stream as air temperatures drop. You know, we have a huge uh, temperature swing in our climate, you know, maybe almost a hundred degree swing, uh, whereas maybe a 30 to 40 degree swing here in on the coast range in Oregon. So those waters are gonna cool down, those leaves are gonna fall into the streams, they're gonna create these, these big, thick, heavy leaf packs that fuel a ton of the life in that stream. And we're gonna talk about a little bit more uh, coming up. And at, at the same time, that canopy drops, right? So there's all this sunlight, all of a sudden can reach the stream bottom. We wind up with this profuse growth of algae. And so we've got a couple of different really interesting food ecology, energy budget dynamics that are going on in our streams. Um, and we have this going on. We got brookies, right? Brookies are starting to spawn. And a lot of times when we think of fish spawning, we often think of springtime stuff, right? And, and a, a lot of our fish certainly do spawn in the spring. But fish spawn year round. In fact, there is a fish called the tomcod that spawns when conditions are like that. So this was in Maine a couple of years ago. I learned about these cool fish that are, that are uh, you know, they're uh, estuaries. So they live in, in the estuaries in the bays and they swim up into the head of the tide. So they swim up right to where the freshwater streams come into that salt water on a, on a, on a full moon closest to the winter solstice. So we're talking about Christmas, New Year's, freezing cold. These were the conditions I got in to get a picture of that fish spawning in about 10 feet of water in these rocky cobbles. Um, so, you know, we have fish spawning going on year round, um, uh, depending on the species. But here in our neck of the woods, right back in the, in the Susquehanna Riverlands, this beautiful part of the planet that we get to protect and store it as a conservancy, we have these, right? We have uh, brook trout. Brookies are such special fish, not just because of their beauty, right? These males are starting to put on this beautiful red color on the belly, on their fins. Uh, as they try to attract a female. Um, they're the only native trout that we have in the East. And so all the other trout aren't from here, right? We, we've got browns that are from, from Europe. And then we've got uh, rainbows that are actually a Pacific coast fish, right? Japan and here in Oregon, they're native, but they're not native to where we are. In fact, when we stock streams with rainbow trout, we change the feeding ecology of that stream to the same degree as if we cut down the forested buffer surrounding it. I'm not opposed to stocking rainbows. We just got to do it in the right way and certainly not stocking rainbows on top of a stream like this one that's got native reproducing brook trout. That's significant because these are the canaries in the coal mine for clear, clean, cold water. In fact, the EPA predicted about 10 years ago. So uh, 10 years ago, they predicted that in 100 years, brook trout would be extinct in their native range east of the Mississippi. Um, now 90 years, right? Because 10 years is off the clock already. Uh, Shannon White's a PhD, re uh, well, she's a, a PhD now, I'm sure. She was a PhD researcher when I interviewed her a couple of years ago, doing research on brookies. And she didn't agree with that EPA prediction because what she found in her research is that brook trout move up and down a river system much, much more uh, regularly than what we thought. We manage these fish as a non-migratory fish. And in, in a way, they're not migratory in that they don't go out to the ocean and come back in, at least not this group of brookies. There are called, things called sea run brook trout in New England. These are not them but they do migrate pretty extensively throughout the same river system. And so what Shannon's work found is that as, as long as we get rid of impediments to their migration, poorly constructed culverts, gravel that might wash in from logging roads, stream crossings, things like that, and allow these fish to get up and down that river system to find that cool, clean, clear water, those refuge areas when things heat up, they will survive climate. Uh, this time of year, Amazing show, right? This male, look at those blood red fins, just incredible, They're like sunsets or sunrises swimming through our streams um, and just, just incredible beauty and uh, prowess and athleticism. I mean, you watch a, a brook trout uh, hunt in a current and, and the, the amount of athleticism uh, and agility in that animal is just incredible as they just pick off you know, insects that are caught in the drift. 
But then they ultimately pair up. You get a male and a female pair. The female uses her tail to beat a red into the bottom, right? So she, she smacks that, that gravel um, into a nest. And what that does is it gets rid of all the, all the sediment. Sediment uh, suffocates eggs, right? Eggs will respire through their membrane, but sediment uh, eliminates the ability of those eggs to be able to do that. And so um, she's making a nest, but she's also creating the right conditions in that gravel, any clean gravel uh, for those babies to, to survive. And so hopefully, you know, that, that, egg, that female will release her eggs, the male releases milk on top of those eggs, those eggs become fertilized. We hope that they become the next generation of, of brookies. And you know, I want to I take a minute and talk about um, things versus beans, right? So I've snorkeled with brook trout, and I've been in rivers for about 15 years now, and I've probably been really intentional about getting in rivers with, with brookies for about the last 10. And you spend enough time with, with something, and you realize they become a someone. And, um, and these trout are certainly beings, right? I mean, there's, there's sentience there, there's, there's an intelligence, it's not like ours, but there's, there's more to these, these fish than just fish. Um, there's, there's an awareness, uh, and I think it's reflected in the eye of this brookie. I mean, you can see this fish making decisions just by looking in his eye. Uh, and it's just an incredible feeling being in a river with, with those kinds of beings. I just saw it yesterday when I was snorkeling with coho. You know, you just look in that eye and you can see their journey um, as they're they're making their way from the ocean back up into the into the coast range rivers, there's a whole bunch of other fish in our rivers and streams still right now, even as things are cooling down, right? Like like this uh, northern hog sucker. This is a, a one of a couple of different sucker species that we're um, um, fortunate enough to have in our rivers and streams. And then we've got rosy sided dace, and rosy sides are just some of our most colorful fish that we have year round. In the springtime, when they're spawning. They look like neon tetras. Remember those little neon tetra guppies that you would get from the pet store when you were a kid and they would be all fired up in this aqua marine color and red. That's what these fish look like in the springtime um, when they are when they're spawning. Um, but in the fall, they just they, they lose some of that that aqua marine color, but they retain those beautiful red sides. And all of these fish start to school up together. Right. And, and first they start to school up as single species units and, and they live less individually and they come more together as a group. And then you start seeing these bigger multi-species schools of fish starting to show up. In fact, sometimes the brook trout are using these other fish to hide. <laughs> so I was trying to get a picture of this brookie and all these fish behind the brookie are, are creek chubs. And that brookie would hide behind the wall of creek chubs to keep me from getting the picture. Too smart for me. Um, and those, those schools of fish continue to grow and grow as the water temperatures cool down. Uh, and they become mixed species to the point where you've got thousands of fish holed up in the deeper holes of our streams. This is from Climber's Run. It's in about four feet of water. And I'm almost positive what's going on here is that that scour hole was deep enough to intersect the, uh, the, the, the water table, right? It's the groundwater. Groundwater is going to be right about 55 degrees in our region year round. Um, and so that's warm water. That's relatively warm compared to surface water temps probably in the next week or two. Uh, and so all these fish are congregating in those deeper holes for that warmer water um, to keep them going for a little bit longer into the season. Um, and then they're, they're not the only fish that do that schooling behavior in the fall when, when temperatures cool. These are called baited killifish. And they're some of the most abundant uh, 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 fish that we have in our larger tributaries like the main stem Susquehanna and in our, our bays like the Chesapeake Bay. In fact, this picture was taken from a, a tributary, a small little tributary called Principio Creek that goes right into the Northern Chesapeake. And what happens is right about this time of year, uh, all the underwater vegetation, all that, uh, that river grass and that bay grass dies back. And that was the main protection uh, that kept these killifish from getting picked off by bass, right? The water isn't cold enough yet for the bass to go inactive and for their appetites to decline. And so these fish are still at risk. And so this is what I think is happening. I think those grasses, those protective grasses die back which means that these fish have nowhere to hide from the bass, from the predatory fish. And so they swim up into these tiny little tributaries into really shallow water, and they hold there until things get cold enough that the bass senesce for the winter, that the bass go inactive, they, 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 uh, they reduce their feeding uh, for the winter time. And I've seen this behavior not only with banded killies, but with a whole bunch of other, what we call bait fish species, you know, minnow species, shiner species, in fact, this, is, this was one of the most amazing snorkels. This was on Thanksgiving Day. Um, I had to break skim ice in order to get into this creek. This is the mouth of Fishing Creek over on the York side, right by Shanksmere. Um, and just incredible swimming through a cloud of fish. I mean, probably, you know, 1,500, 2,000 fish strong. A mixed school, right? So 
uh, satin fin shiners, um, uh, spot tail shiners. Um, hard to distinguish sometimes between the two species and just an incredible clouds of fish. At first I thought the, that the, the, the water was cloudy like with sediment or that my mask was fogged because of the blurriness of the bottom. Then I realized that it was fish that were moving and it was this in mass thing. And I think the same thing's going on here, right? These are some of the most abundant fish that we have in main stem Susquehanna in Lake Clark. Underwater grasses, underwater vegetations died back at the end of the season. They need a place to go to get some, to, to get a little bit of a, a break from being preyed upon by the predators that are still pretty active because the water's getting colder, but it's not that cold yet. Other fish that are starting to school up right now in the fall for a reverse trip, right? These are, these are baby herring. And this is so hopeful, right? I mean, the, the mid-Atlantic population of herring is reduced 90% in the last 25 years. Um, it's a pretty scary prospect. These are the babies. These are the young of the year that were born in April um, and that are starting to school up to head back down river and to head back out into the ocean where they're gonna live for a couple of years and they're gonna come back up and spawn just the way their parents did this past spring. Uh, you go to uh, some of the tributaries lower in the bay. These fish don't do real well with dams. And so dams are certainly impediments to their ability to get back upstream to spawn. But if you go to, to uh, some of the tributaries that are a little bit lower in the Susquehanna, we still have pretty strong uh, herring runs. And you go there right around Easter and you see shad and herring making their way upstream to lay eggs and have these babies. And then this time of year, you start seeing those babies shoal up and head out to, to repeat the process. And there's hope in that. In spite of that 90% decline in the last 25 years in the population of these fish, and look at the beauty of these, the colors that they, you know, the, the, the slate blue and the metallic blue and the silver, and then their sides just kind of reflect the ambient color. It's just incredible being in the river with this many fish that have one thing on their mind, and that's spawning. Um, but seeing the, the, the process itself, seeing these, these adults spawn, and then you know a couple months later, uh, nine months later, you see the babies starting to school up and head back out downriver, out into the ocean. There's hope in that. That in spite of this massive decline in the number of of, uh, um, of, of herring in the mid-Atlantic, we're talking about blueback and river, which are really difficult to differentiate without dissecting them, which we're not going to do to figure out what what we're looking at here. We call them river herring. Um, just an incredible feeling of hope and inspiration to see this process go full cycle in spite of the declines. And these fish are declining because of, again, impediments to, to migration. There's a theme there, right? Brookies are at risk because of that. The adult, uh, the, the, uh, the herring are at risk of that. But also overfishing. You know, in ecology, it's rarely one silver bullet smoking gun kind of thing. It's usually multiple, multiple threats, you know, uh, cut by a thousand paper, uh, death by a thousand paper cuts kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, the same thing applies to, uh, to mid-Atlantic herring. You know, there's overfishing going on, there's impediments to migration, there's water pollution, there's sedimentation of their spawning beds. Um, all of that contributes to, um, to having their numbers drop. But what a thrill to be in the river with both the babies and the adults. Um, and then as our waters continue to, to cool, you know, we round the curve on Thanksgiving, we approach uh, December and things are starting to get a little bit chilly. Um, and things really slow down like this black nose dace is so slow. There's actually sand on his back. So you see all those little specks right there, that sand from the bottom that have accumulated on the back of this fish. He's that slow uh, because the water is that cold, right? These are ectothermic animals, theoretically, right? So ectotherms mean they basically, their body temperature matches that of the environment. Uh, there are some fish species that do have the ability to, to uh, metabolize heat the way we do as mammals. But for the most part, fish are ectotherms, right? They, they reflect the ambient environmental temperature. So as things cool down in the water, metabolically, fish are gonna slow down. That black nosed ace is so slow, he's, he's not getting the sand off of his back. And this sunfish is so slow that it's snuggled into this fold of the bedrock and climbers run. And it's just kind of snuggled in there for it's part of the winter time. And as that's going on though, there are other fish that take advantage of this. Sculpin, right? This is a beautiful sculpin that I never see out in in the warmer seasons. I only ever see them in the in the middle of winter when there's like no other fish out. There's gonna be sculpin bopping around the bottom. See, there's a bottom bottom fish, right? They got those big, beautiful, big pectoral fins up up front there, and that big mouth. These are ambush predators, and so they're gonna set up shop somewhere. You can see how this coloration really well matches the 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 uh, the quartz pebble stream that this fish was in. It'll just sit there and wait for some prey item to come by, like a couple of leaves, 
right? Nothing to see here, just a couple of leaps. But wait, what? What is that thing? What's that head sticking out from under there? Oh, look at that. It's a caddisfly. Surprise. Um, so caddisflies are just this amazing group of benthic macroinvertebrate uh, uh, organisms, right? Benthic macro, benthic being uh, bottom macro, big enough that you don't need a magnifying glass to see it, uh, or you don't need you don't need magnification, you don't need a microscope to see it. And then invertebrate, right? No backbone. So it includes things like aquatic insects and snails and crayfish and freshwater mussels and things like that. Um, in the winter time we start seeing a whole lot more benthic macroinvertebrates uh, active in the stream than we do in the growing season. Now, part of that is because of their life cycle timing, right? These, these insects were eggs back in April, maybe. And so they just went through a couple uh, instars of development and they got to be big enough where now they're out and about uh, and, and obvious. And part of it, I think, is a behavioral adaptation where the predators are, are down for the count, right? They're, they're, the fish are done for the winter time. It's too cold to eat. They're all hunkered down somewhere. They're not active anymore, except for maybe the sculpin. So it's time to go out and party if you're a caddisfly. And the way you party as a caddisfly is you make your own case, right? So this one made its cases, made its case from leaves. And they have a silk gland on their lower jaw that produces silk that's very, very similar to lep lepidocrine silk. So very similar to the moth and, and butterfly silks. And they use that to cement different kinds of things together. A different species will cement different things together. There's a Northern case maker caddisfly. You can see that this one, this northern case maker likes twigs and sticks, right? Same thing with this one. And this is going to be about, you know, a good inch, inch and a half long. So these aren't tiny. These are pretty good sizable, almost eatable size. Um, uh, and the neat thing is, though, I'm a snorkel and climbers run last winter, and I saw this. This is a caddisfly that is cutting a stick, a twig, to the proper length so, so they can add it to their case. I mean, it's just kind of mind blown, you know? There's a whole bunch of other caddisflies that are out there. These are humpless uh, caddisflies. Um, and so look at the cases. The, look at the beauty in this case. So the, you know, the, the beauty of, of the, the caddisfly cases is, is in the form and the function both. It provides them protection. But look at the colors of this. This is made out of vegetative material um, that they spin into this, this silk smooth case. And you see those things in the front there, right? Those are its legs. And so this caddisfly is holding its legs in the current catching stuff and then bringing them in and licking them off. And there's one, right? Put your arms in the air or in the water, I guess, like you just don't care. Um, just such a cool way of making a living and so much more abundant in the wintertime than any other time of year. And again, I think it's two pieces to this. One is it lines up with their, with their development, but it's also, I think, a behavioral adaptation. And these are just some of the prettiest uh, insects, I think, that we've, we've got living in our streams. Um, here's another um, uh, a longhorn uh, caddis that creates its case out of these sand grains, right? And you can see that white silk that cements these all together. Uh, and there's just some, some incredible beauty uh, related to the mosaic that these, these caddisflies uh, create. And in fact, you can buy caddisfly case earrings now. There are people that take caddisflies and put them in, in bins. And then they, when they molt out of their case, you can, you can get the earring. Um, and these are, these are more uh, longhorn caddisflies. These are cemented to the bottom. These cases aren't mobile. Uh, but you can see how they feed in the water column. And you can even see um, part of their, their, uh, their anatomy, um, that white stuff or the spiracles, it's part of their, um, um, part of their uh, uh, circulatory system. And then they, all of these caddis ultimately uh, metamorphose into an adult that kind of looks like a moth, right? This is an adult caddisfly. Adult caddisflies have one thing on their mind, that's reproduction. Um, males will mate with females. And then the females, when you read an ecology book, it says females lay eggs in water. That's about the extent of it, right? Females lay eggs in water until you experience it, right? So this is a snorkel trip. It's in this incredibly difficult rapid. I am in the lee of this big boulder. There's about a car-sized boulder right there that this silver thing right here is a female caddisfly. Um, and and, and this, this, I'm having a really hard time hanging on in this current. And yet hundreds of these female caddisflies are making their way back down into the water to lay their eggs, right? So the, the River Ecology book says female caddisflies lay their eggs in water. Seeing what it looks like completely changes that state. What a profound um, act, right? All that silver on them is air that's being held against their bodies uh, with, with fine, fine hairs. That's enough oxygen to get them back into the river so that they can lay their eggs on the underside of this rock. This is a suicide mission, right? If you don't get picked off by a fish on the way down, 
you're probably going to drown on the way back up. And that's the idea behind being a caddis, right? You've got one thing to do in life as an adult caddis fly, and that's reproduce and make the next generation. And being able to see literally hundreds of these little silver bullets walking their way back down this boulder to lay the, the eggs of the next generation was absolutely mind blowing. But they're not the only uh, insects that we've got that are more abundant in the winter time than other seeds. We've got these beautiful stone flies. Look at the size of that stone. That's a good inch and a half uh, insect right there. And there's another, look at the pattern on that one. I mean, stone flies are just some of the most amazing, beautiful uh, uh, benthic macros that we've got. Uh, they indicate, both caddis and, and stone flies indicate really good water quality, by the way, depending on the caddis fly species. Some caddis flies can tolerate you know, moderate pollution. Stone flies cannot. And again, stone flies come springtime are gonna bust out of their, their nymphal case, right? Uh, and this is what that is. That's a nymphal shell. Uh, they're going to become an adult with, uh, and, and they've got one thing on mind, and that's to, to find their, the love of their life and spawn, right? Reproduce. I don't think insects really spawn, but to find the love of their life and have babies. Uh, and that's what those, those maize are doing, or those stonies are doing. And we also have mayflies. And again, more abundant now in the, in the wintertime coming up than other times of year. And so I just love getting into our rivers all through wintertime with the intent of documenting the, the amazing benthic macroinvertebrate life that's there, the amazing insect life that's there because it's so much more prevalent and out in the open. But just incredible coloration, even as the, as the youngsters here. And that'll lead to this, right? Oh no, the mayfly hatch at, at Wrightsville and, and Columbia. Um, let's all freak out, shall we? Um, not to make light of it, I understand that when you get a, you know, a foot tall pile of, of stinking mayfly carcasses at your front door underneath your porch light. It's not the most pleasant experience. At the same time, these things represent a relatively healthy river that in spite of all the insults that we throw at the Susquehanna and in spite of all the difficulties this river still endures, we have this burst of biomass, this burst of life. These insects require relatively clean water to, to survive as the juveniles. And so when we have this, this major hatch going on, I got this at long level two years ago, I believe, that's a celebration to me. In spite of getting covered in these insects and in spite of the unpleasantness that sometimes is associated with them covering the deck of the bridges and on the front doors of, of people's homes, it really is a celebration of life. Uh, it's a celebration of a healthy river, a relatively healthy river. We need a lot of work on that. Um, Ted Evgenitis, our river keeper, is doing an amazing job of protecting that lower Susquehanna, but he's one person. The Conservancy is doing an amazing job by protecting land. Uh, Conestoga, uh, Conestoga River Club is another player in this, right? And, and the partners go on. So it's a celebration of life. It's a celebration of clean water and, and conservation successes. But it's also a celebration of beauty. I mean, look at the veination in those wings and the color on that male. And those, that's a male because of those, those, you see those legs on the front there? That's how he's going to latch onto a female. Um, just an incredible, incredible uh, natural feat that we get to be party to every spring. Um, and it all starts back here. Right, it starts with these clean, clear, cold waters coming off conservancy preserves. It come, starts with the leaf fall that turn into these leaf packs, and this is 50% of the energy that enters streams comes into the stream in the form of leaves uh, coming from the the adjacent forest. The other 50% comes from algae, and a lot of that algae is produced in the winter time when that canopy uh, drops, when we lose the, the leaf cover canopy, and so the streams are, aren't shaded in the in the winter time. Sunlight can hit the stream bottom directly. So that's a big shaggy carpet of algae that's got a bunch of air bubbles on it. So it looks like it's snowed underwater. Um, and all of that fuels these insects, right? And these insects are the primary vehicles by which that vegetative biomass is converted into animal biomass, right? Both as the, the juveniles, especially, right? These, that's what these insects are eating. They're, they're grazing on the algae. They're eating on those leaves. And then they emerge as the adult. And all of that biomass, both juvenile and adult, feeds this fish biomass, right? So trout really do grow on trees. And so do the white suckers that are next to that trout. And so do the creek chubs. And so do uh, the northern hognose. Um, and so do the, the rosy sided dates. And so do the salmon that I'm going to snorkel with tomorrow. And so wintertime is going to keep on marching, right? It's going to get cold. Our, our days of ice on rivers is actually going down and that's a concern. Uh, ice plays a pretty significant role in river shaping and river ecology. And so if we, as we increase the number of ice-free days on our rivers with, with global warming and climate change, that has the potential to shift um, river ecology. And we're not sure what that shift is gonna be yet. But in a typical winter, 
um, you know, things are going to ice over and it's going to get chilly and it's going to be time for me to put a dry suit on. And it's going to be a time for mental note to not fart in said dry suit um, and see life. There's still life there, right? This is, this is a juvenile uh, a sea lamprey. And so sea lampreys just get a bad rap because they're invasive in the Great Lakes. They're native here. They're a migratory fish. They spend about six years out at sea. Um, they feed on, they prey on, they're really predatory. But the, the way they make a living is they latch onto the side of a fish and they suck the, the lifeblood out of that fish to the point of death, right? So a true parasite doesn't kill its host, a predator does. So they're really predatory, um, but they make that living by, by sucking the blood and the, and the body fluids out of those fish. And so, you know, people kind of freak out about that. It's, it's a, a little bit of a gross way of making a living. Um, and they're migratory. And so this is a male that migrated back upstream and you see his nose is all beat up because he just made a red. He's taken bowling ball sized cobbles and rolling them out of the way with his sucker, sucker mouth. Um, will spawn in that red. Uh, the juveniles are called amicetes and they look like worms uh, and they, they actually filter feed and they'll live for six years as filter feeders in our rivers. And so think about the services that these animals provide us as those filter feeders. Um, and then they metamorphose into that juvenile Right, and then that juvenile will sometimes hitch a ride on a shad or a herring or a rock bass, and head back out to sea. And they're just hitching a ride, and so they're attached to the side of the fish, but they're not sucking the blood or anything. They're just getting a ride back out to sea. It'll become an adult out at sea, and um, and come back into our rivers to spawn. And again, these are native to where we live, right? These are native on our rivers and streams, uh, invasive on the Great Lakes. And typically, if you do a web search, a Google search for Sea lamprey, the only thing you find out about these fish is they're bad, 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 bad because of the experience in the Great Lakes. They got introduced, we put a bunch of canals into the Great Lakes and, and the, uh, the lamprey pretty easily went from their native range, um, which is that, that, um, that yellowish color, that mustard yellow color um, into that maroon color, which is the non-native range. Uh, we have lamprey here on the West Coast. Um, they're called Pacific lamprey and they are endangered. And my friends here at Freshwaters Illustrated did a movie about uh, the Nez Perce uh, uh, tribe's efforts to protect Pacific lamprey. Uh, it's a story about this man, uh, Elmer Crow, Nez Perce elder, uh, not a fisheries biologist. He was a construction worker. He drove, he drove uh, dump trucks for a living. He stood on uh, a gravel uh, bar not far from this spot. In fact, this is the South Fork of the Salmon River in Idaho. And he saw what he thought was the last eel swimming across that sand flat. Now, Nez Perce call eel, uh, 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 Call lamprey eels. Critically important to Nez Perce culture, to ceremony. Um, in fact, Wilson Wewa, another Nez Perce elder, asked the question, uh, made the statement, they, give them, they gave themselves up so that we could live uh, because they were a food source when food was scarce. Uh, those lamprey were making their way up the Columbia River Basin into the tribs of the Columbia, like, like the South Fork of the Salmon. Um, and they, were, uh, they provided food for the Nez Perce people. Um, Elmer thought what he saw was the last lamprey swimming across the sand flat here. And he went back to camp. That was 1972. Went back to camp and asked the creator, why did you show me this fish? You know, what's the meaning of this? And then it dawned on him. He was up to, it was up to him to do something. And so he did. Um, he created a truck and transport program to get those lamprey up and over all the dams in the Columbia River to get them back into their natal streams. Um, and it's been successful. And it's not a restoration program to restore those those fish because it's not a reproduction program, but it keeps the population that's there reproducing. It allows them to continue on. Um, and then there's hope in that because as long as we have lamprey there, Pacific lamprey there, uh, we can work on restoring populations instead of just maintaining. Elmer also made a pretty profound statement about these fish, right? The salmon that I'm swimming with right now. Salmon are having a horrible time recovering in spite of all the efforts that we're making at getting them around dams. And Elmer's point was the reason the salmon aren't recovering is because the lamprey aren't recovering. Again, not science, traditional ecological knowledge. Elmer knew these rivers and he knew these beings better than anybody else on the planet. And he put this together. And I think it makes perfect sense to me. Think about the life cycle of those Pacific lamprey, six years in it as an amicete, and then the juveniles, and then the adults, and all that food that would be available for salmon that's no longer available because those lamprey aren't available. They're gone. Uh, it makes sense that salmon recovery is, is struggling because these aren't single species ecosystems. These are multi-species ecosystems. And sometimes we tend to try to manage them as single species ecosystems. Um, 
you know, it makes sense that that salmon would would get a lot of nutrition out of these juvenile these juvenile lamprey as they were making their way back down those river systems, um, in, back into the Pacific, and in our case, you know, on the uh, on the East Coast to the Atlantic. And this was Elmer's uh, uh, life philosophy, right? We are the circle. That's what life is all about. We take care of one another. So when we have someone in trouble, that's when the rest of us have to step in. And that's exactly what he did. And I'm so inspired by, by his story um, that is so beautifully told by Freshwaters Illustrated. Strongly recommend you go to their website to check out not just the lost fish uh, uh, video, but you know uh, my friend Jeremy Monroe is the director of this program. I've got a bunch of friends that work here. Uh, Jeremy's the director and he's posted a number of of his short videos that are free for folks to uh, to take a look at. Um, and you can always get a hold of me uh, if you have any other questions about snorkel and rivers and streams through uh, any of the seasons. It's certainly a passion of mine. I'm so grateful to be able to work uh, for the Lancaster Conservancy to further the mission of protecting uh, our, our lands and waters forever. Uh, what we do on land directly impacts water quality. And uh, it's so obvious when I snorkel a stream that's coming out of a uh, a Lancaster Conservancy preserve uh, compared to one that's not uh, because that protected land really does produce clean, clear, cold water that all those beautiful fish we just looked at depend on. And so those are the other beings that we need to take care of, as Elmer says. And, uh, and thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Keith, so much. That was absolutely incredible and, and really emotionally moving. Um, I'm just so inspired by the, the work that you're doing to illustrate what's going on below our streams and rivers and what that tells all of us that we need to be doing to protect those streams and rivers um, and, and the work that's already been done by so many um, in our, our community and our nation. Um, we have time now for some questions and answers. To ask any questions of Keith, just click that Q&A button on your screen and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can tonight. Um, and tonight's Nature Hour is being recorded as well. If you want to go back and check out any other parts of this Nature Hour again um, and see some of those incredible photos that Keith shared, they are truly incredible, Keith, really incredible. Thanks. They don't compare um, to Jeremy's work, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they really are. And it's so Thank amazing you. that they're local to our streams and rivers here, the streams and rivers um, that we can see. And I'm just actually curious just to start off for you know, those of us in our community who want to go out and see what you're seeing here, especially as winter is coming and it seems like there's a lot of activity with macro and birds and fish. What advice do you have for our community members who want yeah, to so, see some of these things? Yeah, so freshwater snorkeling is really safe. You know, anytime you're around water, it's gonna be a hazard, right? Our lungs in water don't mix very well. And so you always, you always want to approach water with a whole lot of caution, but really freshwater snorkeling is very safe activity. You're, you're in shallow water, so you're not going deep. There's no need to go deep. Um, I rarely am in water over my waist. There's no need for it. Um, now, with wintertime, that changes a little bit because water can become dangerously cold. And so when I'm going rivers in the wintertime, I am really thoroughly prepared. I'm wearing multiple layers, including a fleece jumpsuit underneath a dry suit uh, on top of neoprene gloves, neoprene hood, neoprene booties. Um, like yesterday, I was extremely remote in the, in the coast range. I mean, I'm literally in the middle of nowhere. I left a float plan with my friends at FI that, hey, if I'm not back by 5.30, this is the general area I'm going to be. But that general area was about a 50 square mile area, but they knew the creek. So as long as they stayed along the creek, they'd be able to find me eventually. Um, so just using a lot of caution in, in the in the wintertime, but summertime, it's so easy. And just go get a mask and a snorkel. You don't even need a wetsuit and just stick your face in the water. And, you know, we're going to run, we'll, we're, we'll run some trips as conservancy for uh, uh, river snorkeling coming up here in the summertime. So that's another option for folks if they want to get involved. A little less extreme than the summertime, it would seem, from a temperature range. I'm, I'm definitely um, inspired by your ability to stand up to the cold. We've got quite a few questions here, so I want to jump in. Um, Elizabeth is asking, uh, first off, your passion for these fish and other critters is so apparent. Thanks for sharing that. Regarding the 90% decline in herring in the last 25 years, is that decline being reversed or slowed at all? If not, it seems like they can't last much longer. Yeah, that's a great question. And we're herring are really hard to assess their populations because they move in mass and they move around. So you might sample one place out in the ocean on a trawler and then, then the next time you go sample and they're not there. As far as we know, they're not declining anymore, right? But they're still at a pretty historic low. So that, that precipitous decline that happened over the last 25 years um, inspired management decisions. Like it's now illegal to possess herring in Maryland, for example, that they were used as bait. 
and now it's it's illegal to possess herring in, in, in Maryland. Um, you know, and the other piece of that is if you're you're working on the mid-Atlantic states, and so multiple states have to come to agreement on how you're going to manage that that fishery. And they've they've it seems like they've succeeded because that steep decline has leveled. So we're not seeing the declines anymore, but we're not seeing the increases yet. But we're hoping now that, that we've stopped the decline, we'll start to see the increase. Well, so there's some, there is some hope. There's a, at least a, ta a, a plateau there they've reached. Yeah, yeah. Um, now this is just so, such a fun time of year here um, in Lancaster, but Lynn would like to know, and I think Lynn, you mentioned you were new to the area earlier. Um, she wants to know what time does this Mayfly emergence yeah. happen? <laughs> That's great. It's usually usually like late May and June, maybe sometimes even into, into the 4th of July weekend. Uh, but it's usually in that in that June time frame. It depends on air, uh, air temperatures and water temperatures. Um, but you'll, Lynn, you'll know about it because it's going to be all over the news. So just look for the uh, look for the uh, the news stories about the uh, the Mayfly emergence. But it's usually in that early summer, that early summer couple of weeks. It's quite the experience. Uh, Peggy would like to know um, that, that the photos of the brookies look pretty small. Um, how large do those adults get? Yeah. So you know, around here, not very big. You know, we're looking at maybe six inches to a foot, and most of those brook pictures that were there were were in that in that ten inch range. Now you go other places like in Maine, and you're looking at foot and a half, two foot large uh, brook trout. But for our region, um, you know, they typically stay uh, you know within about a you know a foot or smaller. Mm. Thanks for that. Uh, we do have a, a question here from Jacob. Um, he wants to know if there are any other guiding snorkeling experiences in the Lancaster area. Um, though I know Keith, you just mentioned that hopefully yeah. uh, we'll be hosting some events with some snorkeling opportunities, but where can one snorkel and, and not just here in Lancaster, but elsewhere as well? Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of great places to go, but in terms of a guided trip, there's nobody else that does that stuff. Um, I, I used to do a lot of guided trips and I got away from it. I'll probably start doing that again, but right now I'm going to really do them as a conservancy. So Jacob or anybody else, just take, keep an eye on the event page for the Conservancy. And, and once things warm up, we'll put a couple of uh, river snorkeling, guided river snorkeling trips out there. But really, you know, um, in terms of places to go snorkel, um, watch for water quality, right? The Conestoga River is really interesting to snorkel, but you don't want to do that after a rain event because of combined sewer outflow uh, possibilities, right? So there's the possibility of getting raw sewage that takes a couple of days to flush through. Places like Fishing Creek, which is one of our preserves, is just absolutely fabulous. Climbers Run is pretty good, but it's on the smaller side. Um, Octorera Creek is great. Certain parts of the Susquehanna are pretty, pretty fabulous. Um, Jacob, if you want specific locations on that, um, send me an email, uh, kwilliams at lancasterconservancy.org, and I can turn you on to the exact spots of where to go. So something else that's been really exciting, I think, in our region recently, I've seen a lot of photos um have been eel weirs that have been popping yeah. up uh, you know some of those drone shots that you can see when the the river is a bit clear um I'm, you know you talked about lamprey and their migration what about eels what season yeah. do they migrate during that that is one of the most amazing mysteries in science still and so you know eels migrate they're catadromous and so that means that they spend their lives as adults up in fresh water they go out to the ocean to spawn we never knew where they went up until recently, right? You think that all, everything is known in, in nature and it's totally not. I mean, how exciting is that? So we knew that they went to the Sargasso Sea, which is basically the Bermuda Triangle, right? Um, and the only way we knew that is because we were doing plankton toes in the ocean. We were getting their leptocephali, which are juvenile eels, right? The planktonic form of eels. So we knew that the adults went there and then the babies came out. So we figured it was Sargasso Sea. A tagged eel from New England. I think I think her her number was eel number uh, forty five. I believe it was or fifty four. Um, was followed to the Sargasso. The tag popped off at like two thousand feet. Just recently, this past year, they actually followed an eel all the way to the bottom of the Sargasso Sea to confirm that's where they migrate to to spawn. So all the eels in North in in our part of North America and Europe, they all go to the Sargasso Sea. And they spawn. We don't have any idea what that looks like. No one's ever seen it. So we're still, the adults go in, the babies come out, don't know what happens in between, <laughs> right? But this, the migration is one of the conundrums of my life because I've been trying to find this thing for years. The story goes that they mass migrate on a moonless night close to Halloween. Now, how creepy is that, right? And some people think eels are kind of creepy fish. I think they're kind of cool, but I get it, right? They're Halloween fish. And so let's add to the, the mystique of this and Moonless night at Halloween, yada, yada, yada. I have snorkeled 
I don't know how many rivers on moonless Halloween nights looking for eel migrations, did nothing but freak myself out thinking about the ghosts that were looking at me. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I've not seen eels migrate. I've seen eels in rivers and streams plenty of times. They're probably the one of the most, or they used to be one of the most abundant fish in rivers and streams. And they've, they've actually declined significantly to the point where some scientists are, are, are uh, suggesting they be added to the endangered species list as a threatened species. They'd be listed as threatened. Um, so um, I, I, they're amazing to swim with, but I've never seen that migration. There's two migrations to that, right? You have the mass migration of the adults in the fall where they head to the Sargasso Sea, but then you have the elvers coming back. And in Maine, there is a, a huge fishery for elvers. Ridiculous, I forget how much a, a pound, $600 a pound or something ridiculous for these elvers. The fishery is regulated by lottery system. I am making plans this year to get up to Maine to, to photo and video those elvers coming back. And they're actually selling those elvers to aquaculture facilities in Asia because uh, in Asia, they decimated their eel fisheries. And so now these elvers that are being harvested for Maine are being sent to aquaculture facilities in Asia to supply the demand for that market. Um, and a, a crazy high amount of, of money per pound to the point where the fishermen that I've heard of through my fish biologist friend in Maine, they carry weapons. Um, because it's such a cutthroat uh, industry up there. Uh, but yeah, that's, and that's an amazing migration. I didn't include it here because I don't have any pictures of it. I have pictures of the individual eels in summertime, but I don't have pictures of the, of the mass migration of the adults uh, going down river in the fall or the big return of the elvers coming back up in the spring. I'm curious, you know, there's a lot of decline. You know, you mentioned the plateau. Is there anything that that gives you hope. I know our, our summers are getting warmer um, and those warm waters can be not so fantastic for the things that live in our, on our waterways. And I'm just curious, Oof. is there yeah. anything that gives you hope right now? Yeah, I mean, it's scary for sure. And it totally depends on the day and my attitude, you know? Um, but overall it's hopeful and, and it's hopeful for a couple of reasons. One is, and this is going to sound totally sales pitchy for the Conservancy, and yes, I work for them, but they didn't tell me to say this. Uh, it's the work of the Conservancy and all the people that support it, right? When you look at Shannon, you look at a researcher like Shannon White, who did her PhD uh, uh, research on brook trout, and when she discovers that <clears throat> brook trout will survive climate change, right? They will survive what's predicted to be the climate, the new climate as long as we allow them to move up and down those river systems so they can find that clear, clean, cold water. Well, the Conservancy has a pretty significant role in that because we provide that clear, clean, cold water. We, we provide those refuge areas that those brook trout are gonna need when it's 110 degree August day. Those brookies can come up into Climbers Run, they can come up into, into uh, Ferncliff, they can come up um, into Trout Run and find that cold water to hold them over until temperatures return back down to a normal, a normal level later in the season, right? And so there's hope in that. There's hope in all the people, all the companies, all the individuals that support our work financially as a conservancy. That gives me hope that there's this entire community of people that come together around conservation, enough to donate hard-earned money so we can keep acquiring land and protecting these special places. There's hope in the 35 people that took time out of their Wednesday night to listen to this tonight. There's hope in the hundreds of volunteers that we have signing up to help us as a conservancy, um, give up their time to help, to help protect these places. And so, and there's hope in, in some of these management wins, right? So the herring, we figured out that they were declining. The fisheries managers took action and it was a highly unpopular action. Anytime you say you can't fish for something anymore, it's pretty unpopular. And yet they took the hard line and now we've, we've, we've flattened that curve, right? And so now we just got to wait for the curve to recover. So there's, there's a lot of hope in spite of a lot of the fear. I, I really appreciate you leaving us with that message. Um, and, you know, just as people are taking in that message and getting inspired tonight by you, um, you know, I just love to leave everyone. Um, we have Jacob who just wants to know um, if you have a few book recommendations, I think, to keep the inspiration going. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, snorkeling rivers and streams. You can get it on Amazon. Um, and uh, this is a good intro, actually. And I, it, this is my book, so this is self self promotion. But the first part of the book is basically how to gear up and what gear to get. And then the rest of the book is where to go across the country. And some of those places are certainly 
uh, the places that are dear to my heart in, in uh, Pennsylvania. That's great, Keith, thank you. Um, and I would just like to say for anyone who wants to get involved in some of those efforts that Keith mentioned, like volunteering, you can just go to lancasterconservancy.org backslash volunteer and find out about both the volunteer land steward program that Keith mentioned, as well as our water quality volunteer coalition, which is actively monitoring um, a lot of the streams and rivers in Southern Lancaster County as well. Um, Keith, I just wanna take a moment here to say thank you again um, as we wrap up tonight and just I really appreciate um, all that you do to inspire others uh, to this work, all that you do to, to get us out and taking action, to give us hope um, and to give us the knowledge that we need um, to be better conservationists and protectors of our, of our streams and rivers and, and the natural lands that um, we've been entrusted to care with. So just thank you so much. Truly appreciate Thanks, it. Joey. Everyone, thank you for coming tonight. We truly appreciate it. A recording will be available within one week. Um, and we hope that you'll join us in 2023 for um, our next season of Nature Hour with a ton of other amazing um, just regional and local experts who will continue to share passion just like Keith has tonight. So thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take Thanks care. Thanks everybody, good night.